uh, Sandra Ikuta. I'm a judge from the Ninth Circuit. Please don't hold that against me. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Um, Justice Scalia once famously compared legislative history to entering a crowded cocktail party and looking for one's friends. And although it's, it's a little bit early to get started on the cocktails, I'm very happy to see many old and new friends here uh, gathering to consider the legacy of a, a celebrated jurist and a brilliant legal mind. So first, please join me in welcoming our panel. I have Professor Tom Merrill, uh, the Charles Evans Hughes Professor of Law at Columbia Law School, Professor Sai Prakash, James Monroe, Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Virginia, Professor Lawrence Solom, Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Law at Georgetown University Law Center, and Professor Michael Stokes Paulson, Distinguished University Chair and Professor at the University of St. Thomas. As the title of our panel indicates, we're here to discuss text over intent and the demise of legislative history. Let me start with a simple question. What difference does it make, anyway, whether judges interpret statutes based on their actual text and original public meaning, or whether judges take into account the law's legislative history? According to Justice Scalia, it makes an enormous difference. Nothing less than the rule of law itself is at stake. For Justice Scalia, the text of the statute is the law. He said, we're bound not by the intent of the legislators, but by the laws which they enacted. By contrast, if judges are free to pursue unexpressed legislative intents, there's an enormous risk that judges will pursue their own objectives and desires. Or as Justice Scalia, the psychologist, put it, when you are told to decide not on the basis of what the legislature said, but on the basis of what it meant, surely your best shot at figuring out what the legislature meant is to ask yourself what a wise and intelligent person should have meant. And that, of course, will bring you to the conclusion that the law means what you think it ought to mean. For that reason, Justice Scalia argued, the use of legislative history has facilitated rather than deterred decisions that are based on the court's policy preferences rather than neutral principles of law. And this, Justice Scalia concluded, is directly contrary to our great American ideal, a government of law, not of men. And Justice Scalia was not discouraged by this view, from this view, by the fact that Congress sometimes writes terrible laws. Justice Scalia explained, if you're dealing with an inane statute, you are duty bound to produce an inane result. <laughs> or as he put it even more succinctly, garbage in, garbage out. There's no doubt that Justice Scalia's fierce adherence to this view had a tremendous impact on the Supreme Court. Um, as you heard from Justice Alito, before Justice Scalia took his seat at the court in 1986, justices adhered to what um, has recently been called the Holy Trinity approach, where the court thought that compelling legislative history was more important than the text of the statute itself. But Justice Scalia's presence on the court would change this long-standing practice. Just a few months after um, Justice Scalia was elevated from the DC Circuit, he wrote a concurrence in a case called INS v. Cardoza Fonseca that would ultimately change the framework for statutory interpretation. Justice Scalia agreed with the majority's conclusion that the Ninth Circuit for once had gotten it right in its interpretation of an immigration statute, but he refused to join the majority's opinion because that included the concept that compelling legislative history could overrule the plain statutory language. Instead, he said, where the language of the law is clear, we're not free to replace it with unenacted legislative intent. And this pattern that Justice Scalia started in Cardoza Fonseca continued the rest of his career, 
I don't mean agreeing with the Ninth Circuit, of course. <laughs> According to a law review article published in 1990, during the period from 1987, when he first wrote Cardoza Fonseca, uh, until 1989, just two years later, Justice Scalia wrote 14 separate opinions criticizing the majority for relying on legislative history. Uh, and the 1999 Law Review article noted that Justice Scalia's approach, if adopted, would represent a significant change in the way the court writes its statutory interpretation decisions, and probably even the way the court conceptualizes its role in interpreting statutes. The subsequent decades, of course, showed that Justice Scalia's strong point of view and powerful pen changed statutory interpretation and the course of court history. As a law review article complained in 2008, in the face of Justice Scalia's fervent opposition to legislative history, liberal justices since 1986 have opted not to rely on that resources in, uh, for certain types of cases. And terming this the Scalia effect, the article speculated it resulted from justices drafting their opinion strategically in order to get Justice Scalia to join. And I can actually give some uh, anecdotal support for this speculation. I clerked for Justice O'Connor in OT89, and I certainly remember flooding the Supreme Court librarians with requests for old dictionaries so we could look up the words and old statutes all to try to get Justice Scalia to join our boss's opinions. The shift from legislative history to statutory text is one of Justice Scalia's legacies. Uh, and just recently, Justice Kagan pronounced, I think we're all textualists now in a way that was just not remotely true when Justice Scalia joined the bench. But, but is that really true? Didn't the court just hold that the federal government is a state in King v. Burwell? And for those of you who don't remember or who have repressed it, that was the case holding that tax credits were available for health insurance purchased from federally established exchanges, even though the act itself only allowed uh, tax credit for exchanges established by the state. As Justice Scalia pointed out in his dissent, who would ever have dreamt that exchange established by the state means exchange established by the state or the federal government. And there are other signs that so-called purposive reasoning, another term for legislative intent, is making a comeback. The court recently held that a fish is not a tangible object in Yates v. United States, and that a toxic chemical isn't a toxic chemical when it's used to poison your former best friend who's now your husband's mistress in Bond v. United States. So the question arises, will Justice Scalia's textualist legacy endure as the court changes? Or to paraphrase Justice Scalia's famous remarks in a different context, must we say, like some ghoul in a late night horror movie that repeatedly sits up in its grave and shuffles abroad after being repeatedly killed and buried, legislative history stalks our Supreme Court jurisprudence once again. So I look forward to discussing these questions and more with our panel. Um, we'll start with uh, Professor Merrill, and we'll have time for questions at the end, possibly. Uh, thank, is this on? thank you very much, Judge. Uh, it is indeed a uh, privilege and honor to speak at this convention honoring uh, the memory and the legacy of Justice Scalia. Uh, I'm a great admirer of his, and uh, certainly he influenced my thinking on a variety of topics. Um, Sometimes I agreed, sometimes I disagreed, but always uh, he was uh, tremendously important in my own development of uh, thinking about public law. Um, I think Justice Scalia's uh, great legacy, others may have alluded to this already, is that he was very concerned with questions of legal method. Um, most judges are eclectic, or maybe a better word is ecumenical when it comes to questions of legal method. Uh, they will use one method in one case, a different method in another case. Uh, it's a question of what fits or perhaps what produces the correct result. Justice Scalia obviously cared about results, but he also cared very passionately about method. And frequently his concerns about method would override uh, his uh, uh, conception of what one would imagine he thought 
uh, the best result in a case uh, might be. And we've already heard about his influence on constitutional interpretation and administrative law, but the focus of this panel is on a statutory interpretation, and so that's what I will focus on as well. Now, both uh, Justice Alito, in his marvelous speech, uh, and the judge uh, briefly alluded to the fact that Justice Scalia did not believe in purposive interpretation. I will uh, dissent from that. I don't think that's quite right. I think Justice Scalia said repeatedly that in interpreting the words of the text, and of course he, dis he disagreed with the search for subjective intentions of the legislature, but in interpreting the text, he said you always have to take into account the context of, in which the words are used. And what did he mean by context? Well, basically he meant that you had to take into account the obvious purpose uh, for which uh, the words are being used. Uh, as he wrote in his Tanner lecture at Princeton, which I think is his most uh, uh, deeply uh, prepared and thought out uh, exposition of his views about interpretation, he said the import of the language depends on its context, which includes the occasion for and hence the evident purpose of its utterance. So I think uh, you have to regard Justice Scalia as ultimately not disagreeing with purposive interpretation, but rather disagreeing with the use of legislative history in trying to ascertain uh, the meaning of the text of a statute. And here I think his legacy was profound. Others have already described how before Justice Scalia joined the court, uh, it was routine uh, to read opinions that rummaged through all sorts of legislative history, looking for little snippets here and there that might support some kind of conception of what Congress intended when it passed the statute. Uh, Justice Scalia, as the judges described, uh, once he joined the court, engaged on a kind of uh, uh, relentless uh, uh, cr criticism of this approach and, and uh, had an, an enormous effect on uh, reducing the use of legislative history. I think today its, uh, its appearance in Supreme Court opinions is very episodic and when it does appear, it's, it appears in an apologetic sort of way. So uh, Justice Scalia, I think, uh, uh, for one person to have had this kind of transformative effect on jurisprudence is truly astonishing. Justice Scalia gave three reasons, as I see it, for uh, discarding legislative history. I think one of them uh, is unsound. I think one of them is sound, but uh, perhaps subject to qualification. And I think the third reason is compelling. Uh, so the unsound reason uh, is that using legislative history is unconstitutional. Uh, the argument, which has already been mentioned briefly, uh, uh, is that, uh, by Judge Easterbrook in the film and, uh, and others, is that uh, snippets of legislative history don't go through the Article I process of bicameral approval and presentment to the president. Uh, and because they don't, uh, it's wrong to elevate these snippets of legislative history to the status of law. They're not law, they're just chatter in the uh, legislative process. Uh, that is all true. Uh, uh, but typically, uh, at least when used correctly, legislative history was not used to sort of override uh, the text. I would freely agree that if the text is clear and legislative history is being used to de determine that the meaning is something different from what the text says, that's impermissible and that violates the Constitution. But typically, legislative, legislative history is being used to resolve genuine ambiguities in statutes, uh, situations where it's unclear what the statute means. And so it's an interpretive aid, not as something that's being used to uh, override uh, Congress's uh, legislated actions. And if you think about it, all the courts use all sorts of interpretive aids to interpret statutes, uh, none of which have gone through the presentment and bicameral process. Uh, Justice Scalia, of course, was very fond of dictionaries. Dictionaries have not been approved by Congress and have not been signed by the president. Neither have the canons of interpretation, neither have the common law meanings of words, the rules of grammar, and so on and so forth. All these things are freely used by judges, including Justice Scalia, to interpret ambiguous statutes. Uh, none of them have been approved by Congress and the President, and, and yet no one thinks that they're unconstitutional. So used properly as a, as a way of interpreting ambiguous statutes, I don't think that legislative history, uh, using legislative history violates uh, the Constitution. The second argument that Justice Scalia made was that legislative history is uh, subject to manipulation. And I think this was a sound argument. Um, it, it's probably the case that uh, Madison's notes or uh, Ferran's collation of the debates on the, the Constitution uh, are not prone to manipulation because those uh, deliberations were generated at a time when no one thought that uh, courts would use uh, legislative history or constitutional history uh, in interpreting a text. But starting in the 1940s, uh, there's a recent article by Nick Perillo at Yale that documents this in great detail. 
uh, New Deal lawyers engaged in a process of deliberately uh, building in a commentary in the legislative history of the statutes they were drafting for Congress, and then appearing in court and citing the legislative history to tell courts what the statutes meant. And so this was a form of uh, blatant uh, manipulation. Uh, which is uh, present at the origins of uh, the use of statutory inter uh, legislative history and statutory interpretation. And Justice Scalia rightly perceived that this was a serious uh, concern. Uh, uh, unlike dictionaries, unlike canons of interpretation, unlike rules of grammar and so forth, which Congress has no say over, obviously subunits of Congress or members of Congress uh, are in control of snippets of legislative history, and so once courts start taking legislative history into account, there's a great temptation to manipulate by planting little dialogues or little colloquies uh, which are designed to influence the courts in the way in which they interpret statutes. Uh, so I think this was a valid point. It's a little bit uh, perhaps uh, overstated or it's subject to rebuttal. Um, one question is, you know, what is the ratio of uh, sincere uh, attempts by legislators to persuade their colleagues to vote for a particular measure uh, versus uh, blatant attempts to manipulate courts? If the ratio, the ratio of sincerity to manipulation is very high, then throwing out all legislative history would perhaps be uh, a kind of dramatic prophylactic rule that might be questionable. Uh, we don't know what the ratio is. No one's able to do a study of this, so it's a matter of some speculation as to how much deceit in, in, is going on as opposed to how much uh, sincere advocacy in the legislative process. Another objection to the manipulation concern is that judges are not idiots. Uh, and uh, give the adversarial pr process works as it's supposed to work, uh, if one side is trying to manipulate the court by citing legislative history, the other side can point out that the other side is trying to manipulate the court by quoting legislative history that's really just potted legislative history, not sincere uh, attempts by one member of Congress to persuade the others. Uh, uh, and so that there's sort of a built-in way in which this manipulation can perhaps be damped down. I don't think that's uh, completely reassuring. You know, I think in the 1970s we got into a situation where one side was trying to manipulate and the other side was trying to counter manipulate, and so uh, maybe uh, the manipulation concern uh, does have uh, serious um, uh, consequences. And again, it's an empirical question as to whether or not it's, it's worthwhile to throw out all leg legislative history based on the concerns that some manipulation is going on. We don't know quite how much. The last thing that Justice Scalia said, and he, he didn't say this as often as he uh, talked about the constitutional problem uh, or about the manipulation problem, but I think this is an, a compelling argument uh, for doing away with legislative history, uh, is that Justice, uh, to put it uh, in one word, Justice Scalia thought it was inefficient. Uh, uh, as he put it in his Tanner lectures, quote, the most immediate and tangible change the abandonment of legislative history would affect is this, judges, lawyers, and clients would be saved an enormous amount of time and expense. Uh, now again, this is an empirical proposition. It's impossible to prove it. I don't know of any studies that have been able to measure you know, how much time and effort and money is spent doing legislative history versus what the payoff is, but I strongly suspect that Justice Scalia was absolutely right about this. He supported his proposition in his lecture by pointing to his time as uh, head of the Office of Legal Counsel during the Ford administration. And back then, of course, legislative history was used in practically every case, and so the Office of Legal Counsel had to devote enormous amounts of time to doing legislative history research. And Justice Scalia reported that uh, most of this time was utterly wasted, that the uh, attorneys would dredge through the legislative history, they wouldn't find anything on point. And his explanation, which I think is entirely uh, plausible and, and persuasive, is that if a statute is ambiguous, it's unlikely that the legislature or the staff spotted the, the ambiguity. The ambiguity usually emerges over the course of time uh, in the implementation of statutes. And so looking for a resolution of the ambiguity in the legislative history is likely to come up with a null set. And so this happens over and over again, and it's a lot of time and energy which is wasted. And I think Justice Scalia was correct about that. I would go further and say that recent uh, trends in the legislative process have probably uh, made this problem considerably worse. When Justice Scalia was in the Office of Legal Counsel, Congress followed something called orderly process in which a bill would be uh, submitted to one House of Congress, there would be hearings, then there would be a markup by the committee, then there would be a committee report, and then the other chamber would follow suit, and then there would be a conference report. And so at least you knew where to look uh, in order to find uh, relevant legislative history that might shed light on the meaning of particular terms. This process has largely broken down. 
uh, what we now see are mega statutes that are patched together in highly idiosyncratic fashions, uh, none of which replicate uh, each other and which make it extremely hard to uh, do any kind of coherent legislative history. Let me give you one example, the Dodd-Frank Financial Reform Act of 2010, uh, which I had the misfortune of doing a little legislative history about uh, recently in, in writing an article. Um, according to a compilation of documents put together by the librarian of the Federal Reserve Board, uh, there is no conference report, there is a conference report, but it says nothing about most of the provisions that were ultimately adopted by the conference. There's no House report and no Senate report. Uh, the uh, act was stitched together from 48 separate bills, uh, the final version of which in, emerged after 19 different steps in the legislative process. The Senate had held 39 relevant hearings, the House 55 relevant hearings. So anyone who is condemned to trying to figure out the legislative history of particular provisions of the Dodd-Frank Act by plowing through this material uh, is uh, to be pitied. Um, um, so uh, I think, uh, so you can say, well, maybe orderly process will return uh, to Congress. Uh, uh, maybe uh, this is a transitory uh, situation. I somehow uh, doubt it. Uh, it's not just a matter, it's part of it, of course, is gridlock and the fact that Congress is narrowly divided and therefore things like the Senate filibuster make it very difficult to get uh, laws passed through orderly process. But part of it's also the fact of the growth of the staff of Congress, the devotion of time to fundraising, uh, the role of social media, uh, and other uh, role of interest groups and other factors which I think have meant that the old-fashioned orderly process that Congress followed is unlikely to be resurrected anytime soon. So I think changes in the, in the way Congress operates that happened since uh, the time when Justice Scalia was condemned to do legislative history in the Office of Legal Counsel have made it even more uh, p compelling that uh, this is simply a gigantic waste of time. I think we should applaud Justice Scalia for trying to put legislative history out of its misery and hopefully the little mice that are coming back in these oral arguments that Justice Alito referred to uh, will not be allowed to propagate and multiply. Thank you. <laughs> So we heard that legislative history use is inefficient. We'll, we'll next hear from Professor Prakash. Well, I want to begin by thanking the Federal Society for inviting me here today. Um, I'm quite proud to be part of the panel. I deeply admired Justice Scalia and I was greatly saddened by his passing. For some of my views on the justice, I, I encourage you to look at a recent essay posted on the Harvard Law Review forum site entitled A Fool for the Original Constitution. It's a full-throated defense and celebration of the justice's jurisprudence. Uh, I should add that the justice was always kind and gracious to me, but today I'm going to follow his admonition to say something that the audience disagrees with. Uh, I'm going to defend the use of legislative history. Um, I think if the justice were here today, I'm sure he would uh, skewer me in various ways, and, and I, I would squir uh, squirm in various ways, but um, uh, I think, I think the, the, the case ought to be made for, for the use of legislative history. Um, let me begin with some data derived from the work of others, particularly David Law uh, and uh, Mr. Zering. The Highmark uh, use of legislative history occurred in the 1970s, before, well before Justice Scalia got onto the court. And it's been declining pretty much ever since. So it started the decline even before Justice Scalia got on the court. And of course, it's continued, it continued while he was on the court. Um, but it has not declined to zero. Uh, it is not to kind of zero, and some justices quite sympathetic to Justice Scalia's uh, approach have used legislative history, including Justice Thomas, including uh, Justice Alito, and including Chief Justice Roberts. And the latter two justices before the Senate actually defended the use of legislative history, notwithstanding the withering criticism that Justice Scalia made against its use prior to their ascension to the Supreme Court. Um, so if we define demise as the utter disuse of legislative history, we're just not there yet, at least not at the Supreme Court. I think it's more accurate to say that there's just been a decline in its use. And I think that's been salutary. I, I think uh, that uh, uh, judges were using, or justices were using legislative history too often, perhaps to confirm their pre-existing biases or conclusions. And I think this amplifies Judge Leventhal's observation that the use of legislative history is, quote, the equivalent of entering a crowded cocktail party and looking over the heads of the guests for one's friends. Justices and judges were looking at legislative history to confirm their, their conclusions they had already reached for other reasons. Um, yet oddly enough, I think Justice Scalia's criticisms made the use of legislative history more defensible 
because he demanded that everyone make a more compelling case for their use. Um, like some others, I think legislative history can provide context of the sort that um, Professor Merrill mentioned in his remarks. Um, I fully understand that there will be some Cook, uh, Cook statements made up just so that they can influence interpretation later on. Um, and if we believe that systematically occurs, that's a good reason for not consulting the legislative history that results or is generated in that environment. But it's not necessarily a reason not to consult legislative history generated in prior environments where there was no, uh, there was no systematic attempt to cook the, cook the record, so to speak. And, and I think we can see this in, in other areas. So let me, let's, let's move beyond statutes and consider treaties and the Constitution. Um, with respect to the Constitution, Justice Scalia engaged in a form of legislative history. He cited the Federalist Papers uh, quite frequently in his famous case called Prince versus United States involving whether or not the federal government could commandeer chief state chief law enforcement officers to enforce federal law. He both cites the Federalist Papers to make his point that Congress cannot do that uh, and to, um, to reject Ju uh, Justice Souter's argument that uh, commandeering of executive branch officials was permissible. Now, of course, again, the Federalist Papers were never voted on by the Philadelphia Convention. They were never voted on by the various state conventions. In fact, they were written after votes in several state conventions. So, you know, the, the same sort of argument that's been made, the sort of constitutional argument that's been made against legislative history could be made against the Federalist Papers and uh, uh, Ferran's records and, um, and uh, Eliot's debates and all the pamphlets and, and other writings that were written at the time um, uh, of the Constitution's creation and ratification. And I think the same sort of argument can, made, can be made with respect to treaties. Um, in Medellin versus Texas, a case involving whether or not President Bush could order the state courts to reopen certain criminal cases, Chief Justice Roberts declared that the court traditionally looked at, quote, text, background, negotiating and drafting history, and post-enactment history, namely the practices of the uh, nation states. Uh, Justice Scalia wholly joined this opinion. Uh, and in fact, um, this made sense because Justice, Chief Justice Roberts was, was quoting and citing a, a Justice Scalia opinion on the use of <laughs> history in the context of treaty, uh, treaty making. In that case is Zickerman versus Korean Airlines. And, and in Zickerman, Scalia says, quote, we have traditionally considered as aids to its interpretation the negotiating and drafting history, and he then uses a French word, travaux preparatoires, uh, and the post-ratification understanding of the contracting parties. And uh, I think that suggests that Justice Scalia did not have a, a categorical uh, aversion to the use of legislative history, certainly not with respect to constitutions, certainly not with respect to treaties. Um, so I view legislative history as a now traditional tool of statutory interpretation no more problematic as a theoretical matter than the use of dictionaries uh, or the use of non-obvious uh, uh, canons of construction that the courts cite to from time to time. As Tom has just pointed out, none of those dictionaries and none of those uh, canons of construction have gone through bicameralism and presentment, but the courts use them nonetheless. And we, I think we kind of assume that Congress understands it, uh, that uh, the courts will use them. I, I agree also with uh, Nick Rosencrantz. Uh, as I understand his argument, Congress could tomorrow require the court to use uh, conference reports, et cetera, to, uh, to understand legislative history. And so the real question is just what's the default rule? Is the default rule that you can't use them or that, uh, uh, that you can? And I think, the, uh, I think Justice Scalia you know, uh, did us a service by, uh, by ensuring that we uh, weren't as reliant on legislative history as we were in the past. Uh, citizens, uh, citizens, uh, citizens of Over Overton Park versus Volpe was sort of a, a crazy opinion to start with the legislative history, but I, I don't think it makes sense to say you should not use it at all. Um, and I want to end by saying that sometimes it is okay to look out over a room and find your friends. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we. We've heard from Professor Prakash that it's okay to use legislative history because all of our friends are using it. And now we'll hear from Pro Professor Solom. Th thank you so much. It's uh, uh, a great pleasure to be here and an honor to be here on this occasion. Uh, so 
<clears throat> my remarks will follow directly from ideas uh, expressed by Tom Merrill and Sai Prakash. Uh, and I want to investigate the relationship between Justice Scalia's views about constitutional interpretation and his views about statutory interpretation. Uh, Professor Randy Barnett, who's in the room, and I uh, together uh, run an originalism boot camp each summer. Uh, and uh, Justice Scalia was gracious enough uh, to meet uh, with our students uh, uh, at every session of the boot camp, so long as he was alive. And we asked him the question, how, how is it that you came in the famous OLC speech where he said we should move away from original intent and to uh, original public meaning? Why did you say that? And, and he said, well, I had a theory of statutory interpretation. And uh, so I was aware of the problems with trying to divine intent. And so it just seemed obvious to Justice Scalia uh, that our approach to constitutional interpretation should mesh with our approach to statutory interpretation. In preparation uh, for uh, this event, uh, I slogged through the 101 opinions that appear on Westlaw where when you search for the phrase legislative history and the author judge Antonin Scalia. So uh, one or two things become apparent. Justice Scalia almost never relied on legislative history in a decisive way in an opinion that he wrote, although he did use legislative history in several opinions. And a second thing that I think is very important. Over and over and over again, Justice Scalia said that the use of legislative history is inappropriate in this case because there is no ambiguity to resolve. And that's very important. Now, <clears throat> that brings us to an interesting question, which is, what do we mean by ambiguity? And I think that there is a hidden ambiguity in the word ambiguity <laughs> that reflects an ambiguity in the way in which we can use legislative history. So I'm going to just I'm gonna come back to that question, but before I do, I want to back up. There, there are, I think, three rival approaches to statutory uh, interpretation. One of these we sometimes call purposivism, but that uh, label is somewhat misleading. This approach is associated with professors Hart and Wexler and the legal process school of the 1950s, and it refers to objective purposes or we can be a little less charitable, judge manufactured purposes, right? And when judges manufacture purposes, they try to give them a pedigree and they might use legislative history for that purpose. That is not a legitimate use of legislative history, according to Justice Scalia, because that kind of purposivism is just legislation from the bench. Intentionalism. Sometimes people talk about intent and purpose as if they were one thing. But intentionalism is the view that we are searching for the will of Congress, for what it was Congress wanted the statute to do in operation. And again, Justice Scalia would say, that legislative history is inappropriate if used for those purposes. Why in that way? Why? Because the will of Congress was not enacted as a statute, right? Congress enacted, went through the 
formalities of bicameralism and presentment, only the text of the statute, not the mental states of uh, the congressman. The third approach, of course, is textualism, plain meaning textualism. Justice Scalia's uh, preferred theory, does intent have a role to play uh, in a textualist approach to statutory interpretation? I think that it does and it can, but that role is very, very limited. Sometimes words use statutes that are ambiguous in the sense that it's a word that can have more than one meaning. Famous example, the bank of a river or the bank that serves as a financial institution. Uh, it's rare that you can't resolve ambiguity <coughs> from the text of the statute itself, because usually the text itself provides sufficient context to resolve ambiguities. But if it does not, then there is nothing inconsistent with textualism in looking to other evidence of context in order to resolve the ambiguity. That use of legislative history, although very rare, is fully consistent with Justice Scalia's view of textualist statutory interpretation. One last point, and it goes to Professor Merrill's uh, discussion of the argument that some use of legislative history is unconstitutional. Uh, unlike Professor Merrill, I think that this argument is correct and that it provides the primary basis for the exclusion of a certain way of using legislative history. So in order to get at this, we need to distinguish between the activity of discovering the meaning of the constitutional text, interpretation, and the activity of putting the constitutional text into legal effect, construction. This is a very old distinction goes back to 1839. Uh, its chief proponent in the 20th century was Corbin. It was used by Wigmore, uh, Williston, and others in the first half of the 20th century. Legislative history can play a role in interpretation if that role is limited to determining the meaning of the text. But when legislative history is used as a tool for adopting constructions that alter or override the meaning of the text, then it is illegitimate. Then it is judicial legislation. Then it is privileging something that was not enacted as law over that which was enacted as law. And it is perfectly reasonable to view that as unconstitutional. Thank you. Okay, so we've, we've heard that it's okay to use legislative history to resolve real ambiguities. Though I must say that judges are famous for plucking ambiguity out of the jaws of clarity. Um, but now we'll hear from uh, Professor Stokes Paulson. Uh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm greatly honored to be part of this conference in honor of Justice Scalia. I've given my own tribute to him uh, in an online article at the Public Discourse website called The Supreme Greatness of Justice Antonin Scalia. I really think he is one of the five greatest, most important Supreme Court justices in the history of the nation and clearly the most influential and important justice of the past 50 years. I, unlike some others, didn't know Justice Scalia personally. I, I shared two meals with him, 30 years apart and in group settings. The first was when he was a judge or one of a panel of judges in my final moot court round and when I was a law student and I had the great good fortune of sitting next to Justice Scalia at dinner and bathing in his wit, grace, charm, and intellect. And then the next meal I shared with him was just last fall, about a year ago, uh, when Scalia came to Minneapolis and spoke at my law school, University of St. Thomas, and just regaled us with stories. 
In between those 32 years, uh, I knew Scalia the way most of us come to know him, and that's through his, his writings. And I became something of a devotee or a disciple of the great Justice Antonin Scalia. So I'm greatly honored to be here. What I'm going to do in, in my 10 minutes is try to back up and, and give you two broader propositions that I think are consistent with Justice Scalia's jurisprudence. The title I've given my remarks is The Interpretive Force of Constitutional and Statutory Legislative History. What is the legitimate force of, cons of legislative history in both constitutional and statutory interpretation? So my, in, in my 10 minutes, I want to make two quick points. First, that the tasks of constitutional interpretation and statutory interpretation are almost exactly the same or very, very closely analogous. And as a corollary that the rightful role of resort to legislative history is or should be almost exactly parallel in constitutional and statutory interpretation. There's some refinements and there are differences, but, uh, but, but basically it is the same enterprise and, and Scalia thought it was the same enterprise. Then the second point I'll make is that there is a simple and logical reason, it's been alluded to already, why certain types of constitutional legislative history, why early evidence of the original meaning <laughs> tends to be more reliable and useful than statutory legislative history today, and why it is therefore more appropriate to resort to constitutional legislative history than modern statutory legislative history. Uh, this is a position that I think also is fully consistent with what just Justice Scalia said. It's why you can rely on your well-worn, tattered, uh, much marked up copy of the Federalist Papers in a way that you cannot rely on committee reports put into bills in the 1970s. So, <clears throat> my first proposition that the tasks of constitutional interpretation and statutory interpretation are essentially the same requires me to back up just a little bit and give you a broad theory of everything you need to know about textual interpretation of written authoritative legal texts. I think that any theory of constitutional interpretation and statutory interpretation ultimately addresses four big questions. You don't have your pens out taking notes? Is what I should okay. the, the first one is just what is the meaning of the text? And that's the project of ascertaining what in theory should be the objective, original textual meaning of the words. So the first question is what does the text actually say? What is its meaning? How do we interpret it? How do we exegete the meaning of the test? text. The second question is what, whether you should follow this text, which in some ways is a pre-political decision as to whether or not you will treat a legal text as authoritative. That's the question of what you do with the meaning of the text once you have found it. The third big question is what do you do when meaning, so, so to speak, runs out? What do you, how do you resolve questions of ambiguity or uncertainty? What are your default rules when the text doesn't answer something? And, and Larry Solom is, is the best in terms of explicating the theory behind that. And then the fourth big question in any theory of interpretation is who interprets the clause? Okay, who interprets the provision at issue? In the constitutional context, that involves questions of judicial authority. What is the scope of judicial authority? Do the other branches of government have an independent power of independent constitutional interpretation? In statutory interpretation, again, all of these are closely analogous. Now, the question of the use of constitutional legislative history and legislative legislative history is basically a question of what is its rightful role in interpreting or aiding in the interpretation of the text itself, the meaning of the text itself. And my proposition, which I think is consistent with what several people have said and is consistent with Justice Scalia's, is that in constitutional interpretation, if you're a good originalist textualist, you do not use legislative history, including the Federalist Papers, in order to displace or modify what would otherwise be the meaning of the text. But instead, you look sometimes to legislative history for its usefulness in displaying or clarifying the meaning of the words of the text. In other words, you are not looking for subjective intentions or expectations when you read Madison or Hamilton or any of the other founding documents. 
you were instead looking to see what, how they were using words and the meaning of the words. In other words, like a dictionary, the Federalist Papers is sort of a concordance. It, is, it operates and serves a dictionary function of explaining the meanings of words and concepts in context, in historical context, and in linguistic context at the time. So legislative history in constitutional interpretation is potentially probative, second best evidence of objective textual meaning. You look to the history and to the historical documents to provide you with help, with dictionary help, in understanding what is theoretically the objective meaning of the words. And Scalia was willing to do this. Uh, and he would do this both in a constitutional context and in a legislative, legislative history context. Uh, in preparation for this, this talk, I went through some of Scalia's law review articles, and one of his more recent ones was one that was sort of a co-authored colloquy with a former clerk and a, a friend of mine, John Manning, who's now a professor at Harvard Law School. It appears in the George Washington Law Review, but uh, Scalia said this, you forget that I don't care what the legislators intended, I care what the fair meaning of this word is. But then he goes on to say, and by the way, I don't object to all uses of legislative history. If you, want it to, if you want to use it to show that a word could bear a particular meaning, if you want to bring forward floor debate to show that a word is sometimes used in a certain sense, that's okay. I don't mind using legislative history just to show that a word could mean a certain thing. We are trying to ascertain how a reasonable person uses language and the way legislators use language is some evidence of that, though perhaps not as persuasive evidence as a dictionary. <laughs> that is using legislative history as mildly informative rather than authoritative. You use it to exegete the meaning of words, not to control or spin interpretation. Now the core problem with the use of legislative history um, is reliability, right? That's the core problem is reliability. Um, and that's a problem to a certain extent with both constitutional legislative history and legislative legislative history, but they are problems of varying degrees because of the circumstances. The huge problem with the modern use of legislative history and statutory interpretation is that it's massively unreliable. It's all spin. It's all gaming the system. And Scalia was uh, adamant about this too. From that same interview, he says, my objection goes beyond that. Legislative history is not just unlikely to reflect the genuine purpose of Congress. It is increasingly likely to portray a phony purpose. The more you use legislative history, the phonier it will become. The more you use legislative history, the phonier it will become. Downtown Washington law firms, some of you are here, making their business to create legislative history. That is a regular part of their practice. They send up statements that can be read on the floor or statements can be inserted into committee reports. So the more we use it, the less genuine it is. It's not that we use it because it's there. It's there because we use it. So I'm going to suggest building on Scalia's proposition, what I will call, uh, sort of immodestly, Paulson's law, <laughs> or Paulson's paradox of legislative history. But it's really Scalia's law. And that is, the more you know that legislative history, either in a constitutional sense or a statutory sense, might count as evidence of textual meaning, and the more that courts have over time shown a willingness to look to such evidence, and the more sophisticated a gamer you are, the greater the incentives will be to make and manufacture legislative history, and the less reliable that legislative history will be. So the more, here, so here's the, Paulson's law, the more a legal interpretive system tends to rely on legislative history to determine textual meaning, the less reliable such evidence is likely actually to become because players learn the game and manipulate the evidence. Similarly, the less aware that deliberators or debaters or drafters of legal language are that they are by their discussions furnishing potentially pro probative evidence of original meaning, textual meaning, 
the less self-conscious they are that they are making legislative history that will affect interpretation, actually the more reliable such evidence will tend to be. Now that is in the main why I think, and I've said it in an article with Voss and Kesevon some years ago, that the secret drafting history of the records of the Constitutional Convention, which were not available to the ratifiers. They were confidential and not meant to be published, and Madison's notes weren't published till 1840, is actually for that very reason a fairly reliable source of evidence for what the meaning actually was. There's some problems with the documentary evidence, and Mary Sarah Builder has a marvelous book called Madison's Hand, talking about the revisions that James Madison made to his notes over time and how it reflects evolutions in his, in his thinking about it. But to the extent he's faithfully recording the debates, the debaters are not intentionally spinning because they are not thinking that they are making legislative history. For precisely that reason, to the extent that the debates real reveal something about what they thought the concepts and meanings and ter of terms actually were, it is, for that reason, more reliable legislative history than statutory legislative history ever can be today. know legislative history can be mildly informative, but only if the legislators don't know anyone is listening. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll have some time for some questions, um, but while you're gathering up your thoughts, I'll, I'll take the moderator's privilege to start a round of questions that's particularly interesting uh, to me. Um, Justice Scalia was very concerned about judges using legislative history and other tools context, purpose, and the like, intent of the legislators to enact their own policy preferences. Um, and I hear from the panelists that uh, legislative history can be okay if it doesn't go too far, if it's used appropriately, but how do you stop judges from doing that? Now we have, um, after King v. Burwell, um, my court saw arguments saying that the context, if you look at the whole statute, makes this language ambiguous. And therefore, you can use legislative history to change the meaning of left to right or federal to state or whatever you want. So given, let me start with Professor Merrill, given that um, your view is that as long as the legislative history is sincere um, and, and not being manipulated, judges can rely on it. Where, where is the stopping place for uh, judges, some, some rule that would actually be enforceable? Uh, thanks for that question. No, my, my position was not that it's okay to use legislative history because judges can figure out when it's phony and when it's not phony. I, my point was that uh, the phony manipulation point may be overstated because it's possible that judges might be able to differentiate between phony and non-phony legislative history. Uh, my bottom line is that we should not use legislative history at all, uh, certainly in statutory interpretation, uh, simply because it, it greatly increases the cost of appellate and trial court litigation uh, for gains that are probably not commensurate with those costs. So I, I would, on a kind of consequentialist utilitarian basis, throw it all out. Uh, but I'm just simply saying that the manipulation concern, which a number of the panelists have focused on, uh, is uh, an empirical question and an arguable question um, uh, uh, and, a, and a, another reason to throw out legislative history but perhaps not as powerful as the consequentialist one. I completely agree with you that once we let it in the door, um, as we did during the 70s, then you know, judges will run with it. It'll give judges more, you know, more, more putty to play with in trying to uh, reach results that they find congenial on the basis of their own preferences. Um, I, you know, I, I think a lot of people criticize originalism and say, look, originalist judges can reach results they want, the text is manipulable. And I, I think, you know, there's no theory of interpretation and, uh, that will prevent judges, willful judges, from doing what they want. And Judge Akuta, you mentioned the, the Burwell case uh, where the text seemed to suggest that, you know, the states were states were the object and not the, the federal government, and the, the court ruled otherwise. And I think they could have done that whether or not they 
they referenced legislative history. So I don't, I don't really know if they legislative didn't. history, they didn't, and so, so I don't really know if legislative history really makes it that much easier for a judge who really wants to get a particular result to reach that result. Um, I, so I, I, I just, I guess I, I, I question the, the predicate. Let me ask how you think a judge would, would have said that um, state means state and federal without saying, here's the context, here's what Congress intended, that makes it ambiguous, done. Well, I, I mean, the, the, any textualist is gonna say we've gotta look at the whole statute, right? We're not gonna read a provision in isolation and decide what it means. Uh, I don't, I, you've put me in a very difficult position of having to defend a decision that I don't, don't agree with, but I, I just think, look, you know, I, with all due respect to, to, to you, Judge Akuta, judges at the federal level have life tenure, and they can pretty much do whatever they want while, while they're on the bench, right? And that's why Brutus said they're independent of heaven and earth. And we shouldn't be surprised if they sometimes flex their muscles and, and make decisions that we think um, misread the statutes, treaties, and constitutions of the United States, whether or not they're looking at legislative history. It's not as if we, if we banished legislative, use of legislative history tomorrow, there wouldn't be manipulation uh, and, and sort of rather odd claims about what the text of, of the Constitution, statutes, and treaties of the United States mean. So I, 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 you know, I, I, I don't want to have def to defend that decision <laughs> to, to make my point. Well, m most of us just, just like to think there's a fig leaf of reasoning and not just raw power, but not all of them, so I'll, I'll grant that. <laughs> um, Professor Solem? So <clears throat> I think that it is surely the case that a judge who's uh, determined to legislate from the bench can find a way to put uh, a fig leaf uh, on that exercise of legislative will. Um, and in, in fact, in uh, uh, King v. Burwell, there was, a, on the blogs at least, there was a whole argument about how the plain meaning of the statute supported the interpretation that the federal government was a state. Um, and, and that reasoning could have been employed by a judge with a straight face. This is why it is so important to consider character in the selection of judges. In order for originalism and plain meaning textualism to work, the judges who apply those theories have to actually have the virtue of lawfulness. That is, they must care about the law. They must care that their decision reflect what the statute said or what the Constitution originally meant, and not what they would like to uh, uh, insert into the meaning of the statute. And so when we think about selecting judges, we're not just thinking about competence. And we're not just thinking about what theories the judge avows. Even, <coughs> Uh, the, most, the, the, the most alive of living constitutionalists can say at her confirmation hearing, we are all originalists now. <laughs> right? And the discernment of character really need, means you need to pay attention to the way that people act and not just what they say. Uh, okay. Just briefly, it's, you know, those of you who work on statutory drafting, and if you ever were to engage in constitutional drafting, realize how difficult it is to write a truly judge-proof text, right? <laughs> you know, so you, you need to have, the judge needs to be running a sound interpretive program, a sound interpretive methodology. It is true that the more things you let come into your interpretive model, the greater the opportunities for manipulation. But that would apply to a number of other things, other doctrines that I've criticized, including stare decisis. 
right? Sometimes you're not just interpreting the statute, you're interpreting interpretations of the statute and you're interpreting distinctions of the interpretations of the statute and you're interpreting manipulations of the distinctions of the interpretations of the statute and pretty soon you have essentially unbridled discretion. I think the, the important thing is that whatever the tools are, that they be as clear as possible. And, that, and that's, gosh, that is the theme of Justice Scalia's 30 years on the court. You know, rules, principles, avoiding judicial discretion except to the extent that judicial discretion is actually called for in this context of the authoritative written text. Thank you. Well, I'll throw the um, questions open to the audience. Does anyone have questions? Uh, I see one down here. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to take uh, Sukrishna's uh, challenge to us that, uh, that essentially to have a relatively bright line exclusion of, of uh, legislative intent or legislative history uh, might essentially require that we break the tablets of the Federalist Papers uh, in, in, the same, uh, in the same motion or with the same rule. And I'm wondering if there might not be uh, a scale of Burkean reliance interests uh, when one looks at the, the importation of that history and the public debate, although I, I understand that several states did vote uh, before some of that was published, if, but if there might not be those interests uh, that would defend the use of uh, you know, you know, properly or not venerated texts that have long been used versus the idea of present day uh, assailment from the floor of the Senate. So breaking the tablets of the Federalist Papers, that goes against the Paulson principle. Do you want to start, can we start with you? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure of the, the, that I have the premise of the question exactly correct, but, but I'll, I'll say some things that I think are true and make the difference. Okay. <laughs> and and that I, we'll see if they're responsive, okay? The use of constitutional or statutory legislative history, what use you make of it depends on what interpretive program you're running. If you're thinking that the relevant evidence is contractual intentionalism, what people actually subjectively believed, you will place a greater emphasis on these texts. If you are a textualist, you will use the Federalist Papers, uh, Madison's Notes, and committee reports on a House or Senate bill as evidence of the meaning of the words, okay? Uh, my sole proposition is that the Federalist Papers in general tend to be more reliable evidence of original constitutional meaning than committee reports do of actual statutory meaning. So it, it, it kind of goes back to uh, Tom Merrill's point that, you know, that there is a question of, you know, the, the manipulability of the evidence and, and how, how, how probative it actually is in a certain context and whether there are differences in ability of judges to use different sources and discern when some sort of history is manipulative and when it isn't. Any is that sort of responsive? Comment? I guess I'll say about the, the tablets, I, I, I love the Federalist Papers, and I cite them all the time. And, uh, you know, I enjoy when other people cite them. And, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a mistake to think that those papers were written uh, just to expound the meaning of the Constitution. They were written to ratify the Constitution. They were the equivalent, in some sense, of floor debates. Right? Because these guys, are, they're not just trying to dispassionately say, oh, here's what the Constitution means. They're trying to ratify the Constitution. It is a piece of propaganda meant to convince people to vote for the Constitution. So they may be better than all the other things written at the time, but, but they're still pieces of political propaganda. And they're great pieces of political propaganda. And I, 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 I think I agree with Mike that there's a lot there that, that, that's actually true. But I think there's also shading in there. I think uh, Hamilton systematically discounts the executive power. I think he systematically discounts the, the strength of the federal judiciary. And other people call him on it, and he tries to respond to them. But it's not always clear that he's, he's right. It's not clear that Mike Paulson would agree with every single claim about the Constitution that's found in the Federalist Papers. I doubt it. Next question. I'm Jordan Pratt from Tallahassee, and my question is primarily for Professor Paulson, but also for the rest of the panel. Um, 
picking up on that distinction between constitutional legislative history and legislative legislative history, how much is the audience question doing the work in distinguishing between the sources? So with traditional legislative, legislative history, the audience typically is the legislature itself, either the, the whole body of the legislature or you know, some subset of the committee. Whereas with many constitutional legislative history sources, especially the Federalist Papers and the anti-Federalist writings to which they responded, the audience uh, was the American public at large. Um, so if the inquiry is, is public meaning, um, how much does that distinction play a role in justifying the use of constitutional legislative history uh, more frequently than the use of legislative legislative history? So how does the audience affect the Paulson principle? Uh, great question. I think that the audience of much of modern statutory legislative history is not actually persuading other members of Congress, but is actually spin doctoring. Right? You know, the, the purpose for many committee reports, floor statements, colloquies, is to affect interpretation of the statute once it emerges and to get a result out of courts. The courts are the true audience. Get a result out of courts that you couldn't have gotten through uh, the text of the statute, because you didn't get it into the text of the statute. I think that <clears throat> at the time that they're debating the Constitution in Philadelphia, and at the time they're writing the Federalist Papers, Nobody very, I mean, they, they know these documents will eventually become public or may become public. And the Federalist Papers were public advocacy pieces. But they're not trying overtly to spin judicial interpretation. Okay? And in terms of what we mean when we talk original public meaning, I don't think that a document has to have been public at the time in order to be possibly probative evidence of public meaning in the sense that it's not a private, idiosyncratic, subjective intention, but this was the public understanding of the meaning of the words. So the, the very fact that the convention records weren't meant to be looked at, right? You know, they, they, they wanted people to look at the text, actually uh, supports the idea that it's decent evidence of public original meaning because, they're, because the audience is, is really the authentic communication to, to other drafters of what it is they're trying to accomplish. ratify the Constitution. So would you, would you be willing to, to say that the Federalist Papers would be more probative uh, than the, uh, the notes of Madison, even though they are both probative, um, that the, 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 the extent of publication um, has some sort of um, something to say about the weight, the probative weight? Uh, let me briefly repeat the question. Is the fact that the document was public and part of the debate, does that increase its probative weight because of reliance, that people actually rely on it. Uh, the problem, mine is not a reliance-based theory, okay? It's not that, the, you know, this is what was said and therefore we are taking it as the meaning because someone said it. That's sort of a intentionalist approach. And I think Scalia would have resisted it. Mine is a original meaning, you know, that both sources are potentially illustrative of the meaning the words would have had in social context to reasonably informed speakers and readers of the English language at the time they're debating it. You know, and if, if, if you can't really rely on the Federalist in saying that people relied on that in deciding the meaning of the Constitution, but it's not clear that it changed the results in terms of the, you know, it was not read in most of the states. It was addressed to the people of New York, and by the time New York got around to ratifying, it was a, a late hit and they ratified largely for political reasons. You know, you, you can't really tell why someone will rel rely on a particular source. Other comments? Uh, just the, I think audience is really important, but just in a slightly different way. The Constitution is written for the public. It begins with the three words, we the people, right? So the relevant context and meaning is the meaning of the constitutional text to the public at large. 
Some statutes work in exactly that way. Some statutes are written for the whole public, but other statutes have a much more specialized audience. Some statutes are primarily written for the agency uh, that will be engaging in the activities authorized by the statute. So then the relevant context of legislative communication is not what would the public know about these words, it's what would the intended audience, the agency, the lawyers uh, involved in this particular subdomain make of these words. And that's really important. So uh, the public documents surrounding the ratification of the Constitution are very good and very direct evidence of public meaning. Uh, in the way that the secret drafting history is still evidence, but, but it's evidence of a less direct sort. Uh, in the statutory context, I think you have to analyze who is the audience of this statute. Okay, next question. Hi, I'm Bob Popper from Judicial Watch. Um, going to uh, Mr. Prakash's point, um, isn't it, I, I understand that a canny, or I guess I would say a lawless judge, can wrestle his or her way around any theory of interpretation, <coughs> but isn't it the case that it's harder to get around a textual analysis in a plausible way? You can always find a purpose, and you can find it in the context, in the newspaper, in the legislative history, but the words are a little bit less yielding. And, and I know this will be controversial, but isn't it the case that judges who want statutes to do more tend to be purposivists, and those who want them to do less tend to be textualists? And doesn't that suggest that it is, in fact, harder to get around the words? Thanks. Well, I think that's a question for me. Um, I, I, you know, I think it's ultimately an empirical question, right, whether or not uh, willful judges uh, need the need the benefit of legislative history to, to do what they want to do or whether they could, could do without it. Um, you know, I'm, I, your comment made me think of uh, the Eighth Amendment and the reference in the Due Process Clause to life, liberty, or property, and Justice Scalia's argument that, of course, um, you can have capital punishment because the Constitution contemplates it, and the argument um, that that's not right, and the argument you know, that it's not right is based on the fact, I think, in part, that the what is cruel and unusual uh, punishment uh, isn't obvious from the face of the Eighth Amendment, and uh, the fact that the Due Process Clause you know, permits the taking of property doesn't answer the question of whether it's consistent with the Eighth Amendment. And, and I've always found Justice Scalia's argument convincing, but uh, I take it that others don't on a textual basis. They think somehow the Eighth Amendment may have, may have modified what would, what would be a permissible punishment uh, if, if, if we conclude that uh, uh, the death penalty is cruel and unusual punishment. So I, I, I take your point that there's just this question about whether or not people can be inventive enough in the absence of legislative history. And I, I, I believe in the ingenu ingenuity of mankind, and I, I, I really doubt that that's going to stop them. Other comments? Yeah, I, I agree with the premise of the question. Um, uh, because it seems to me that in order to do whatever you want to do based on simply the text requires a tremendous amount of intellectual de dexterity. Um, so take uh, King versus Burwell, uh, the Affordable Care Act opinion where Chief Justice Roberts writes this very lengthy opinion saying that to give a literal interpretation to this one clause in the Affordable Care Act would violate what he called the plan of the statute. And he goes through page after page after page of sort of explicating what he thinks the plan of the statute was, which really means what the purpose of the statute was. Uh, and, uh, and it's an impressive effort. Uh, you know, you come away reading that, well, this is a really smart guy writing this opinion. Uh, but I, I think legislative history actually permits a much wider range of uh, judges with uh, lesser skills than <coughs> Chief Justice Roberts uh, to pick and choose little snippets from this uh, bit of legislative history, that bit of legislative history, and conjure up some kind of outcome uh, that may be more congenial. So I, I, think there, I think there is something to the point that using legislative history increases the amount of data that judges have and, and therefore gives them more leeway, particularly if they're not capable of doing some kind of Scalia-like or Roberts-like <laughs> 
uh, whole act kind of interpretation, which is extremely intellectually clever, uh, to uh, achieve the results that they want to achieve. So I, I think that's right. One, one reason to do away with legislative history is it'll, at the margins, in cases where uh, we don't have uh, a lot of other interpretive material, uh, damps down on the range of outcomes that judges can reach. So we actually only have time for one question, but since we have two people in line, we're going to do speed questions. So could you Thank please you. ask a quick question yes. and we'll have a quick yes. answer. Uh, my name's Craig Lean. I'm the city attorney for Coral Gables, Florida. Uh, my question was about executive interpretations, executive officers, attorney generals. Uh, because of the nature of their role, since it's not judicial, um, and it's more tied to the democratic process, do you believe that when executive officials interpret the law and apply it, do they have more leeway to look to legislative history or should they follow the same basic principles that a judge would? I, I have an answer to that question, which is that they're, when they're engaged in actual interpretation, their role is exactly the same. But we frequently see uh, executive officials and Congress engaging in what uh, Professor Barnett calls double deference. That is, they say, well, this is my interpretation of the statute, and if I'm wrong, the courts will correct me. And then the courts say, well, we defer <laughs> to what's gone on in Congress or the executive branch, and that's really a problem. Last question. To the extent that legislative history can be used to evince the original meaning of the text, what privileges legislative history over any other sort of learned debate at the time? Like, why are the Federalist Papers more superior evidence of the meaning of the texts at the time than debates of the Whig Cleosophic Society or newspaper debates in the New York Times and the Herald or any other sort of intellectual debate on the meaning of the texts, and if they don't have a privileged status over any other contemporaneous, contemporary, intellectual, learned debate on the meaning of the texts, wouldn't that open up the universe of evidence that could be used to, to interpret it so wide that essentially every blog post on the meaning of uh, state and King Beaverwell would have the same stature as the legislative debates at the time? Response? I think that's directed to me. I think if, if I understand the, correct, the question correctly, the answer is it is not privileged over other learned public discussion contemporaneous with the time. Uh, I, I, I referenced this article. Uh, my co-author, Vasan Kesavan, and I uh, wrote this article called The Interpretive Force of the Constitution's Secret Drafting History. It's in Georgetown Law Journal. But one of the examples we raise is the hyp uh, a hypothetical letter from John Clergyman to Joe Farmer Parishioner in which there is a learned discussion of the contemporaneous understanding of the meaning of the executive power. We say in principle when we're talking a, a theory of trying to understand the meaning of the words, all of these sources would be potentially usable evidence. What makes the Federalist Papers especially good is that they are especially good. It is, a, it is a learned topical concordance of the discussion, very systematic, uh, in the main reliable, and it was part of the public debates. So I think in principle, if you have an original meaning jurisprudence, you potentially do have the problem of opening the world up to more sources of evidence of what could count as evidence of original meaning. In that sense, it is less constraining. But if you limit the uses to which such evidence can be put, it is, I think, more constraining. Oh, this is a great way to end our panel. Could you please join me in thanking our brilliant panelists? Thank you.